The purpose of this video is to talk to you about three words, evidence, analysis, and interpretation. Um, I, I guess you could think of it in sort of what I just created off the top of my head is a little bit of an equation. E plus A equals I. So evidence plus analysis equals interpretation. Um, I'm, in this video I'm going to define all of these words and then give you some examples, walk you through, this is really more of a, a process walkthrough, um, but I hope that it will help you better understand some of the concepts and the, the required levels of thinking and almost like showing that thinking um, that are needed in your close reading paper. So this quote that I found just kind of as I was pulling resources together for this course, someone wrote, all interpretations require evidence and all evidence requires analysis. If you remember that, if you have that in your close read, then you're pulling in all the, the components that you need. And if it's sound and logical analysis and an interpretation from the evidence and analysis, then you're going to have a great paper. And then all you have to worry about is structural things, grammar, stuff like that. So keep that in mind. E plus A equals I. You want to make sure that in your own writing you can identify what is the evidence, what is your analysis, based on that, what is your interpretation. So let's define some of those words for a couple of minutes. Evidence is, I think, where you start. So evidence is that text-based content, this can be quotes, probably some of the best evidence is quoted material, paraphrases, you are explaining the specifics of what's happening in a particular passage, so more details than just a summary, um, but it will be in your own words, whereas quotes is straight word from word from the text. And then also, text-based content doesn't have to be just the language, it can be descriptions of the text's form or structure. Evidence fuels your analysis and, and it will help you find your interpretation. Um, evidence is when, you know, when I say uh, in the close read video, um, annotate the text as you are writing on that, pulling those strange oddities out of the text saying, hmm, this is interesting. I wonder why the author did this or circling words or finding connections. All of that is your evidence. The stuff you see in the text, that's your evidence. You want to look at it. Again, it's almost like you're at a crime scene and you're saying, okay, we've got this um, you know, crash here or this body. What happened? How did we get here? Let's look at the evidence. So you're looking at the specifics that you see um, you know, outside in the world, in the house, or here on the page. Analysis and interpretation, I think, are the two words that can get um, kind of blended together, but they are, in my mind, two different things. And in the um, essay one assignment sheet video that hopefully you've already watched, I, t I use both of these words and I say, you, know, you have to have an interpretation and you have to have analysis. So really, I want to hash out kind of the difference between those two things. So if you know you have your evidence and you found them in your text, Analysis is an examination of that evidence. It's like breaking down what you see on the text, inspecting each part of it. I mean, word by word inspection. What's this? What is exactly the definition of this word? Um, how can the definition of this word help me better understand the author's choices here? And then figure out what the author is trying to say. Um, your analysis helps you get to your overall interpretation of the text. And I'm going to show you some sample analysis. So it's really like digging and digging and digging at the evidence and saying, what's going on with this? Not necessarily making big picture claims about the text yet. That's the interpretation. The analysis is just, all right, what do, what do I see going on here? I have the evidence. What do I make of it? And then you can interpret that. So your interpretation is the big picture, the overall derived meaning from a text, um, what that text represents. I'm going to follow up this slide with, I think, I think five slides with examples all on um, Coleridge's The Aeolian Harp. So 
If you haven't read that, you can certainly go ahead and read it or you can watch this video and then go ahead and read it. Um, here is sample evidence. So again, I am just picking things straight from the text that I think are interesting. Now, I'm going to tell you before I did this, um, that I started with just what I thought was cool, which was his use of supernatural language. I do needed some other evidence in order to come up with an interpretation for this. So when I started building this PowerPoint, all I had here was evidences A and B. I didn't have C yet, but when I realized what interpretation I came to, I thought, okay, I need to show another piece of evidence in order for my interpretation to make somewhat sense. So the there's two bigger pieces of evidence and then three small pieces total. One of the big ones is Coleridge, is Coleridge uses supernatural language to describe the harp and its sounds. So we have two quotes here, such a soft floating witchery of sound. I thought that was really interesting, uh, describing a sound as witchery. Strange. Um, <clears throat> and then in two further lines, he writes, as twilight elephants make when they at eve voyage on gentle gales from fairyland. And so I thought that was interesting too because he's saying the sound is similar to little elves when they're coming somewhere away from their little fairy land. So what's it like what's up with that? What exactly does he mean? I mean, I picture in my head like a I don't know, like a dancing, twinkling kind of thing happening here, um, but I don't know why he's telling us this. That's as far as I got first, and then I realized I needed another piece of evidence. So that's my second big concept, but my third piece. Um, toward the end of his poem, he praises God and speaks positively of his faith in God. So he writes, and he does this even more than the evidence I have here, but just for the purposes of brevity for this video, I just, I selected just one. He says, save when with awe, I praise him and with faith that inly feels. Okay, so I'm gonna figure out what exactly that means and what I wanna say about it. This is just the evidence. So remember that equation. Evidence plus analysis equals interpretation. You cannot have just evidence and jump straight to the interpretation. I can't say, hey, look what he wrote, here's what the poem is about. That's jumping from A to Z. So I need all the little letters in between. I need to say, okay, it's about this, 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 and this. Here's how I get to my interpretation. Again, a close read paper is similar to a process analysis in that you are walking me through your thought process and that's what I'm about to do here and that's what the analysis is. It's, it's like in math. So if anyone is taking this class and you're like, wow, uh, I like reading, but I don't know how I feel about writing about the reading that I'm reading. Um, but maybe you like math. Well, what I'll say is the analysis component of the close read, it's like showing your work in math. Um, you can say, here's what I have. I have 6,000 divided by 7.2. That's your evidence, so to speak. Then you can give the answer, you know, whatever that is. That's your interpretation, whatever 6,000 divided by 7.2 is. But how did you get there? It's the showing your work part. That's the analysis. Okay, so sample analysis. Um, I'm working through A, B, and C, and I'm just gonna walk you through this process. What I will also tell you about my process is I didn't really know where I was going, but I thought these things were interesting, and I trusted myself to say, I can find an interpretation if I just dig at what is strange to me or odd to me. And again, I had to come back and say, okay, my interpretation needs another piece of evidence, but I started here not knowing where I was headed. And that is okay and exciting and probably what draws me to close reading and writing about things because you never know what you're going to end up writing. Um, so let's talk first about just Evidence A, that quote from line 20, such a soft floating witchery of sound. So um, in the rubric for your essay, you're going to notice that the distinctions in the analysis component of that rubric say, did you walk me through each 
step of your thought process. That's an A score for your analysis. Did you walk me through most of the steps in your thought process? That's a B score for analysis. Some of the steps, C, one or two steps, D, and then no steps. You skipped analysis altogether. You had maybe a statement, but you didn't really analyze anything. Um, what you see here on your screen in each bullet point, A.1, A.2, A.3, A.4, those are the steps that I'm talking about. So the speaker of the poem equates the sound of the window harp to something like practicing magic. Okay, that's, that's fair. That's true. That's a valued statement. So what? That's not enough analysis. If you just popped that into your paper, and these, by the way, all of these bullet points, all of this content that you see on your screen that I'm reading to you here, all of this is the, the meat and potatoes that make up the analysis writing within your paper. So you just write these things out in a logical format. Um, then I said, all right, so there's some connection between the harp and magic. What's up with that? Well, it seems like the speaker of the poem feels that something he can't see is pulling or um, pulling strings or controlling an object and it's magical. So like there's some unknown force that's making this harp move and dance. Well, it's not really moving, but making it sound out that music. Now, he doesn't just say witchery of sound, he says soft and floating. And I'm thinking, well, these are pretty, pretty positive words. Like picture something soft and floating. It kind of relaxes you and it calms you like the music is doing. Um, and it's a, it's a, that sounds like a really nice feeling. So my interpretation is that this is a positive connotation. What do I make of that? Well, let me get to my last step here in my analysis. It seems like the speaker of the poem has a positive perspective of magic or a positive perspective of an unseen being that can influence others or influence objects. So he's like, okay, I can't see this. It's controlling the harp. And I'm kind of cool with it. I like what it's doing. It's working for me. Okay. All of that is coming out. I could write a whole paragraph on just this one line, and that's a close read. You see how closely you're getting to that poem. Um, it's not enough for me as a writer to say, you know, the author writes such a soft floating witchery of sound. Here, the speaker of the poem has a positive perspective of magic. How do you know? Well, that's where one, two, and three in that steps of your analysis come into play. You have to explain explain it to me. Talk about connotation, the underlying meaning of a word. Is it positive? Is it negative? Is it good? Bad? Talk about denotation, this, the literal definitions of words. That's also great. Those are great places to start if you're thinking, all right, I think I, I want to look at this component of the text, but I don't know what to do now. Define all of the words. Just go to Google, look up definitions. How about my analysis for evidence B? It's a little bit more lengthy. So he goes on to write, as twilight elfins make, when they at eve, voyage on gentle gales from fairyland. So in my head, I'm picturing what's happening. We have these twilight elfins and they're leaving fairyland and they're, um, you know, kind of going somewhere. And that's weird. Like, why is he writing about that? There Are there elves in his room? I don't know. So first I say, well, twilight. They're not just regular old elfins, they're twilight elfins. Um, twilight is the time of evening where the sun is just dipped below the horizon. It's not really that dark outside. There's maybe like a soft blue gray glow. I don't know if that's going to matter. So then I ask myself, so what? Like, why did he make these elves, twilight elves, and not daytime elves? I don't know, but that's interesting to me. So, and? Well, here, this holds a slightly more mature and mischievous connotation. So it's twilight. Like, what are we doing as people when the sun's going down? We're settling in for the night. Maybe we're starting to get sleepy. But here we have these twilight elfins, and they're coming toward us, maybe. I don't, I don't really know. I have to look at that again. Um, but the, the elves are coming out, 
and they're coming out to be wild, and he quotes wild in, in line 24, so I feel confident in saying that. Um, the elves are leaving their natural habitat, right? He says they're going on a voyage from fairyland, not to fairyland. They're not going home. They're leaving home. They're like nocturnal elves, maybe. They're leaving their fairyland, and they're going somewhere, and if the wind is blowing that sound over the harp, and it's similar to the elves, then maybe they're coming toward us. And so maybe um, they, they're headed into, and the, here's my third point of analysis. We have these little, he doesn't say elves, he says elfins. So it's fine, another thing to do, you know, if you're not sure. What could the author have said, but didn't say? That matters. These aren't big adult elves. These are elfins, little ones. So there's a difference here between some kind of like magical creature that's grown and knows what it's doing through purpose or maybe even malice as opposed to these childlike elves. So what is what do you make of that? Well, I make of that. The speaker of the poem equates the sound um, that the heart makes to like a playful sound, a gentle sound. It's not too serious. You think of children playing. They're little elephants. They're like, let's just go explore and figure out what kind of a mischief we can get into. But it's a, again, connects back to my last slide. For me, this reading is a positive one. He's like, I like this. I like the little elephants. I like the witchery uh, sounds that are coming through the heart. Um, all right, so that gets me to my last point. Coleridge, 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 uh, depicts the harp and its sounds as causing some kind of trouble. Like, hmm, they're playing around here, but it's a playful playing around. So then my question is, well, what kind of trouble might that be? That is how I'm probably going to get into my interpretation. And that question is why I decided I need another piece of evidence. So... I see that the speaker of the poem is fine with this playful, magical, childlike being coming in and disrupting things. So I probably should read the poem again and figure out like what that's alluding to. So that gets me to my next slide. Um, and this is my last analysis sample. So here I'm looking at the final piece of evidence, and I'm going to analyze that. Remember, all evidence requires analysis. So if I'm going to list that out as evidence and I'm going to use it in my paper, I have to analyze it in some way, even if it's on a minor scale. So then um, he writes in a, really the, the last third of his poem a lot about his faith and how like God saved him um, and turned him into a better person so that he can have the life that he has. So he has this one line, uh, well, two lines, save when with awe, I praise him and with faith that inly feels. So I used a lot of the dictionary here. Like I, I know what awe means in my brain. Uh, it's not a word I'm unfamiliar with, but I still looked it up in the dictionary just to really solidify the definition in my mind and see if it gave me other words that I could then use to help me with my analysis. So he's referring to God when he says, I praise him. This he, this um, masculine pronoun that he's using is God. Um, with awe, is saying, okay, he respects God, he fears him, and he's fascinated by him. That's the definition of awe. And because he uses that word, he's giving us all of these other words all within one. Respect, fear, and fascination. He also uses phrases, that phrase, that Inly feels. He's feeling this faith with faith that Inly feels. The faith is on the inside Maybe it's the faith that's doing the feeling. I should reinterpret this um, or reanalyze this. So he feels that faith on the inside. It's within him. He doesn't have to look toward external factors. It's just existing. These emotions are here and they're, they're here naturally. Um, there's no external pressure forcing him to feel his faith. It's just there. It's inside of him. I think that's my interpretation of this component of the, of the poem. Um, and then I mentioned that in my analysis, I think it's noteworthy 
that this internal feeling toward an unseen but still felt. Okay, so he feels it. He doesn't see it. He feels it. His faith in God, he feels, right? Um, it's unseen. It's similar to the wind controlling the harp. He can't, you can't see the wind, but you can see the effects of the wind. He's saying, I don't see God, but I feel him, or I feel the effects of him. So interesting. All right, so this is my analysis. This is as far as I'm getting with it. I'm sure there's other things that I can bring in to really help solidify my interpretation, but for brevity, I'm moving on. So my sample interpretation, and this is my last slide here, I have these premises that I derived from the previous three slides, from my analysis of the evidence. So we know that the speaker of the poem has a positive view of the unknown or unseen, but something that's still felt, right? Um, we know that the speaker of the poem sees this unknown or unseen force that's as somewhat mischievous, but in a playful way. We know that the speaker of the poem is a religious and faithful person. The speaker of the poem sees the wind that controls the harp as disruptive, but a positive force. And he seems to use this knowledge to reinforce and solidify his own faith in God. It's like he's saying, look, I can see the wind blowing through the harp. No, I can feel the wind. I can hear the effects of the wind blowing through the harp. This, this natural force that's coming in and doing mischievous things, but things that I like. If he says, yeah, I can hear the effects of the wind and I can feel the effects of God or my faith in God, then God is just as real as the wind. And I can confirm that the wind is real. Okay, so like, what is up with that? Well, this is going to lead to your interpretation, your thesis statement. Here's what I'm arguing this poem is really kind of about. So Samuel Taylor Coleridge's poem, The Alien Harp, is more than just an ode to an object. It is a poem that rationalizes God's existence through a comparison of a window harp to a higher religious authority. Now, I want to read the poem again and see if I really think that, but based on um, Noting strangenesses, noting things I think are cool about the poem, finding oddities, or asking myself, what's up with that? Digging even further to try and figure out what's up with that, putting it all together, taking a big picture snapshot, I can come up with this thesis statement. I did not know when I first sat down to write this PowerPoint that this is, this is what was going to be the final slide. I hope that makes sense. I hope this offers um, some helpful information, but just remember, all interpretations require evidence. All evidence requires analysis. E evidence plus A analysis equals I, your interpretation, basically your thesis statement. Email me if you have any questions. Email me if you need help finding evidence figuring out your analysis, and coming up with an interpretation.